Good morning, year 11s. Today, I'm um, Mrs. George again, and today I'm on page um, 47, which is, uh, I'm going to put it as chapter 4. So that is chapter 4. So today we are going to look at chapter 4, which is on page 47. And on chapter 3, towards the end of chapter 3, we saw that um, Eli Eliezer, Eli is, is um, arriving at the camp, a new camp called Buna. So at the moment he is in Buna. And here he says that, he starts by saying, the camp looked as though it had been through an, through an epidemic, empty and dead. So the camp Buna was actually looking a bit empty. Only a few well-dressed inmates were wandering between the blocks. Um, we had to pass through the showers. The head of the camp joined us there and he gave an impression of kindness. The head of the camp, he gave an impression of kindness. Uh, we were given new clothing and settled into new tents. Uh, I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm just looking at the important ones. All the inmates agreed. Buna is a very good camp. Uh, one can hold one's own here. So everyone is actually agreeing that Buna is a better camp compared to the others, uh, compared to the other camps. Um, most important thing is not to be assigned to the construction commander as if we had a choice. Yes, our tent leader was a German. So the tent leader was actually a German. An assassin's fly, a face, fleshy lips, hands resum resembling a wolf's paws. So his hands resembling... Uh, a wolf's pose it's more like an animal kind of imagery because um, I'll tell you that in a minute so you could say it's animal imagery comparing that guy to an uh, uh, to an animal like resembling a even even his hands are resembling a wolf's paws and you know why that uh, is uh, compared to an animal or uh, compared to a wolf's paws um, later on the camp's food had agreed with him, uh, he could hardly move. He was so fat, like the head of the camp. He liked children. I would like you to highlight that. They realized that, like just like the head of the camp, this person also liked children. Immediately after our arrival, he had bread brought for them, some soup and margarine. In fact, and that's really important, in fact, this affection was not entirely altruistic. Um, there existed... Here, a very, very, veritable traffic of children among homosexuals. I learned later. So, Eli Wiesel didn't know that time, but later on, he realized that it was actually human trafficking. They have been um, abusing the children. That guy has been abusing children, and that is the reason why he likes children, and that is the reason why Eli Wiesel has used, um, uh, like the head of, the, uh, sorry, that's the reason why he has used. He has compared his hands resembling a, a wolf's paws. So it's just like an animal. He was just like an animal ready to jump on people. So the sexual predation of boys is actually another example of the inhuman treatment or inhumanity. You could even say this is an example of inhumanity or the theme inhumanity is actually coming here. Inhumane treatment of the boys, uh, of the Jewish prisoners by those who had power over them just like the German leader just like the tent leader who was actually a German so uh, don't forget about that animal imagery especially used by Elie Wiesel to show his character to his to show his inhumane nature so don't forget that um, I'm just scrolling bits and pieces would you like to get into a good commando all right he said I can arrange for it um, I refuse to give him my shoes so everyone is asking for shoes um, like he have to give something to get something. So it's always an exchange things. But uh, Ellie Wiesel refused to give him shoes. They were all, they, they were all I had left. So he was not ready to give his shoes because that was his only possession of value at that point of time. So that was the only valuable thing that he had at that point. I will also give you a ration of bread with some margarine. He liked my shoes. I would not let him have them later. They were taken away from me anyway in exchange of nothing that time so at first he said he will um, give something um, if he is going to give he will give a ration of bread but later on he didn't uh, Ellie Wiesel did not give his shoes but later on he anyway he lost it later on and in exchange for nothing so that was that's that's how it works in
camps. Um, the medical checkup, again, they have to, when they come to a new camp, they have to do the medical checkup and they will be quarantined. Uh, they will be quarantined for some days. It's all mainly um, to limit the spread of disease among the slave labor. And it's not because they care for the laborers or they, it's not because they care for the people. It's because um, they could get most out of the work of the prisoners. So they just wanted healthy people to work for them. That is the reason why they are undergoing or they are asked to undergo the medical checkup. It's not just for the welfare of the people, but it's just to, it's, it's all for the profit of the Germans. Um, the first Hadley examined me and he just asked, are you in good health? Uh, on the other hand, the dentist seemed more conscientious. He asked me to open my mouth wide. In fact, he was not looking for decay, but for gold teeth. Again, gold teeth that was precious during that time and even now. Those who had gold in their mouths were listed by their number. I did have a gold crown. So he had a gold teeth. Um, the first three days went by quickly. On the fourth day, as we stood in front of our tent, the capos appeared. Each one began to choose the men he liked. You, you, you. They pointed their fingers the way one might choose cattle or merchandise. Uh, that's a bit uh, an important I don't know, I'm not able to highlight some pieces, but that's that's all right. They point at their fingers the way they might choose cattle or merchandise. I, I want you to underline that bit as well. I don't know, I can't highlight that, but try and um, highlight that one. Again, this comes here, the theme of inhumanity, treating them like cattle or treating people like, like property, like commodities. So that's inhum inhumanity, or you could even say dehumanization or dehumanizing, dehumanizing people. So just like they are, just like we are pointing at the cattle, or like a commodity, they are, he has just come and he just point, said, "You, you, you." They pointed their fingers the way one might choose um, cattle or merchandise. So. Make, sorry, mechanized, and uh, that's dehumanization or inhumanity. And again, we followed our capo, a young man. He made us halt at the door of the first block near the entrance to the ca camp. This was orchestra's block, so this was a special block, orchestra's block. He mentioned, uh, sorry, he motioned us inside. We were surprised. We had to do. We were surprised. What had we to do with music? The orchestra was playing a military march, always the same. Dozens of commandos were marching, marching off. In step to the workyards, the capos were beating the time, left, right, left, right. SS officers, pen in hand, recorded the number of men leaving. So it's all marching. They are all made to march. Uh, we struck up conversation with our neighbors, the musicians. Almost all of them were Jews. Juliak, that's an important character. Juliak, a Paul, with eyeglasses and a cynical smile and pale face. Another one, Louis, a native of Holland. I can't underline, underline that. A well-known violinist. He complained that they would not let him play Beethoven. Jews were not allowed to play German music. Hans, the young man from Berlin, was full of wit. The foreman was a Paul, Franek. That's another important character. Foreman um, Franek. He is a Polish uh, person, Paul, a former student in Warsaw. And again, so these are the two main characters. That's why I have highlighted those two. Juliak, he is a violinist and Paul Franek, he is actually the foreman. He is the foreman of the camp, of that um, block, of that camp. Now, Juliak, the violinist, explained to me, we work in a warehouse of electrical electrical materials not far from here. So they are working in an electrical uh, warehouse. The work is neither difficult nor dangerous. Only IDEC or ITEC, I don't know how the correct pronunciation in German it is, uh, I, I'm going to say Eidek. So he, only Eidek, Eidek is a capo and he occasionally has fits of madness and then you would um, better stay out of his way. So Juliak is actually a bit experienced. He came there a bit earlier and Juliak, the violinist, says to Elie Wiesel that you, uh, this is actually a good camp, this is actually a good place, work is not hard, but only thing that you need to um, keep in mind is about uh, Eidek, the capo, who actually gets occasional fits of madness. He'll be, at times, he'll be really angry. You are lucky little fellow, said Hans, smiling. You fell into a good commando. 
Ten minutes later, we stood in front of the warehouse. A German employee, a civilian, came to came to meet us. He paid as much attention to us as a, as would a shopkeeper receiving a delivery of old rags. Again, look at that sentence. And there is a beautiful a simile there. He paid as much attention to us as would a shopkeeper receiving a delivery of old rags. So there is a beautiful um, simile there. And you could actually see again the dehumanization, treating them like products, like commodities, just like, just like as if a shopkeeper receiving a delivery of old rags. So dehumanization, again, you could see that. Uh, and again, we are meeting Franek again. Franek, the foreman, assigned me to a corner. Franek is um, not a bad guy. Franek, the foreman, assigned me to a corner. Don't kill yourself. There is no hurry, but watch out. Don't let NSS catch you. Please, sir, I'd like to be near my father. All right, your father will work, work here next to you. So uh, we could see, at times, we could see action of kindness, act of kindness, at moments of there are at times or moments of kindness we could see that um, your father will work there and then two boys came to join our group that is also two important characters they are also two important characters Yossi and TB we are two brothers from Czech whose parents Czechoslovakia whose parents had been exterminated in Birkenau they lived for each other body and soul so they are our uh, two brothers Yossi and TB you will also see them later on. So three characters, you're meeting three characters, three important characters. First one is Juliak. As I told you, uh, he is a violinist, Juliak. Foreman, uh, his name is Franek, good guy. And then Idek, another capo, again, at, at, um, at times, occasionally he has uh, fits of madness. And then we meet again, you'll see NTB here, two brothers. They quickly became my friends. Having once belonged to a Zionist youth organization, they knew countless Hebrew songs. And so uh, we could, we would sometimes hum melodies evoking the gentle waters of the Jordan River and the majestic, majestic sanctity of Jerusalem. We also spoke about Palestine. Their parents, like my, mine, had not had the courage to sell everything and immigrate while there was still time. We decided that if we were to allow if we were allowed to leave until the liberation, we would not stay another day in Europe. We would board the first ship to Haifa. Again, hope. We could see how people are having still hope. They are holding on to their hope and they um, have got hope. Still lost in um, his Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic dreams, Akiva Drama. Can you remember Akiva Drama, the character that we met like before? Akiva Drama had discovered a verse from the Bible which translated into numbers made it possible for him to predict redemption in weeks to come. Again, we could see hope and faith. He trusts Akiva has got great hope and faith in God. So hope and faith. So he relies on faith. He actually relies on faith. And here we could see Akiva Drama uh, he's trying to get a verse from the Bible and he's trying to translate that and the translation made it possible for him to predict redemption for the weeks to come. So he's actually predicting that they will be freed, they will be liberated in the weeks to come. So we could see Akiva Drummer's hope and faith and he actually relies on his faith. And that is contrary to Elie Wiesel who is actually at the stage not praying well. Remember he was such a um, dedicated a uh, Jewish person and he was very very much into the Kabbalah, Kabbalah uh, the divinity into very much into the faith but now that's all gone contrary to um, Akiba Drama who holds on to his faith and who relies on his faith we had left the tents for the musicians blocks we now were entitled to a blanket a wash bowl and a bar of soap so it's better um, Another, the, the main uh, person, the main officer was actually a German Jew. He was actually a German, but still he was a Jew. It was good to have a Jew as your leader. His name was Alphonse, a young man with startling wizened face. He was totally devoted to finding his block. Whenever we could, he would organize a cauldron of soup for the young, for the weak, for all those who dreamed more of an extra portion of food than of liberty. Again, another action of kindness, act of kindness. You could see there again, act of kindness at times we could see act of kindness 
One day, when we had just returned from the warehouse, I was summoned by the block secretary, A7713. We know that that is a levy cell. That's me. After your meal, you will go to see the dentist. But I don't have a toothache. So again, um, he is using ellipses there. After your may meal, without fail, I went to the infirmary block. Some 20 prisoners were waiting in line at the entrance. It didn't take a long to learn the reason for our summons. Our gold teeth were to be extracted. So the reason why he was called is mainly to get his teeth, gold teeth. And they wanted to extract his teeth. Um, so remember here, when uh, he is not even, he hasn't even got his name now. It's actually a loss of identity. I have said this theme before, loss of identity. His identity is completely lost and he hasn't got even a name. He's just called by the number A7713. So loss of identity we could actually see there. Uh, the dentist, a Jew from Czech, had a face not unlike a death mask. When he opened his mouth, one had a ghastly vision of yellow, rotten teeth, seated in the chair. I asked me meekly, what are you going to do, sir? I shall remove your gold crown, that's all, he said, clearly indifferent. I thought of pretending to be sick. Couldn't you wait for a few days, sir? I don't feel well, I have a fever. So Ellie Wiesel is trying to find an excuse to get, um, to, get uh, to escape from him. He wrinkled his brow thought for a moment and took my pulse all right son come back to see me when you feel better but don't wait for me to call you i went back to see him a week later so as promised hilly weasel went back again with the same excuse i still was not feeling better he did not seem surprised and i don't know whether he believed me yet he most likely was pleased that i had come back on my own as i had pro as i had promised he granted me a further delay. A few days after my visit, dentist's office was shut down. He had been thrown into his prison and was about to be hanged. So after a few days, uh, the dentist, he heard that the dentist office was completely shut down and that that dentist had been thrown into prison and was about to be hanged. And the reason is, it appeared that he had been dealing in the prisoner's gold teeth for his own benefit. He has been trying to... Um, do or extract teeth and such kind of things mainly for his son benefit so that is the reason why he has been um killed or he has been it was about to, that's the reason why he was about to be hanged and in the uh, ellie weasel says i felt no pity for him in fact i was pleased with what was happening to him again look at the um he has got a little bit of revenge in his mind and he says that i feel no pity for him my gold crown was safe and he actually felt relieved because um, his gold crown was safe. It could be useful to me one day to buy something, some bread or even time to live. So he clearly knew that all these kinds of valuable things will be useful later. At that time, at that moment in time, all that mattered to me was a day, uh, all that mattered to me was a daily bowl of soup, my crust of stale bread. The bread, the soup, those were my entire life. I was nothing but a body, perhaps even less a famished stomach. The stomach alone was measuring time. So that's also really important. There is one theme called self-preservation. They all preserve. They are trying to keep themselves safe. So that is self-preservation. And he here says that, uh, Elie Wiesel says that his desires or his desires and motivations have actually become simplified. He says that it could be uh, I could I could keep that gold crown safe because someday one day maybe I could buy something using my teeth or uh, some bread or even time to live. At that moment in time, all that mattered to me was my daily bowl of soup, my crust of stale bread, the bread, the soup. Those were my entire life. So in at moments like that, people feel that their life is the most important thing. And many times in our life, we feel that um, we, we never see the value of life because we have been living in the luxury and we are uh, constantly getting all that we want. And at that time, we never, we forget actually to give thanks for our life. But at moments like this, especially in war, people actually understand the value of life and the importance of staying alive and having uh, having the importance of having their own life that, that that is the main thing that is the luxury 
having that life is the luxury for them. So it's self-preservation. So keep in mind that theme, uh, self-preservation. Again, in the warehouse, I often worked next to a young French woman. So thus, he is actually now meeting another French woman. Uh, we did not speak. She did not know German and I did not understand French. I thought she looked Jewish, though she passed for Aryan. She was forced. She was a forced labor inmate. One day when Edek was venting his fury, I told you Edek, um, at times he gets um, really angry at people. So one day like that, I happened to cross his path. He threw himself on me like a wild beast, beating in the chest on my head, throwing me to the ground and picking me up again, crushing me with more violent blows until I was covered in blood. Again, you could see the violence and inhumanity, brutality, violence, inhumanity, the theme of violence and inhumanity, um, treating them like animals. Uh, as I bit my lips in order not to howl with pain, he must have mistaken my silence for defiance and so he continued to hit me harder and harder. Abruptly, he calmed down and sent me back to work as if nothing had happened, as if we had taken part in a game in which both roles were of equal importance. I dragged myself to my corner. I was aching all over. I felt a cool... I felt a cool hand wiping the blood from my forehead. It was a French girl. She was smiling her mournful smile as she slipped me a crust of bread. She looked straight into my eyes. I knew she wanted to talk to me, but she was paralyzed with fear. She, she remained like that for some time, and then her face lit, lit up, and she said in almost perfect German, Bite your lips, little brother. Don't cry. Keep your anger, your hate for another day, for later. The day will come, but not now. Wait, clench your teeth and wait. So we could again see another act of kindness, another act of kindness through this lady, this, through this French lady. And uh, she is actually uh, being very nice to Elie Wiesel and trying to help him. And uh, he actually, she actually says that, uh, don't cry, keep your anger, your hate, for another day for later so it's like it's more like an act of kindness and giving uh, hope and giving hope and motivation such kind of just comforting and act of sympathy it's mainly an act of kindness or a sympathy so keep that also in your mind many years later in paris i sat in the metro so this is something that has happened later many years later after he was out of the um out of the out of the country. Many years later in Paris, I sat in the metro reading my newspaper across the ale, a beautiful woman with dark hair and dreamy eyes. I had seen those eyes before. Madam, don't you recognize me? I don't know you, sir. In 1944, you were in Poland, in Vienna, weren't you? Yes, but you worked in a depot, a warehouse for electrical parts. Yes, she said, looking troubled. And then after a moment of silence, wait, I do remember. He decked the capo, the young Jewish boy, your sweet words. We left the metro together and sat down at a cafe terrace. We spent the whole evening reminiscing, reminiscing. Before parting, I said, may I ask one more question? I know what it is. Am I Jewish? Yes, I am. So the lady said, yes, she, she is a Jew. From an observant family, during the occupation, I had false papers and passed as Aryan. And that, is, that was how I was assigned to a forced labor unit. When they deported me to Germany, I eluded being sent to a concentration camp. At the depot, nobody knew that I spoke German. It would have aroused suspicion. It was imprudent of me to say those few words to you, but I knew that would not betray me. So here, the woman actually survived, or the, this woman's survival is actually an example of how, how some Jews were more aware of the dangers they faced and they were able to make take they were able to take enough right measures they even risked their own life to avoid being marked for death in concentration camp so by forging the papers by giving false papers she actually escaped so the woman actually survived because of her because of because of her initiative in or uh, because of her more awareness about the danger she was really aware of the danger and that's why she take she was able to take enough um, or prop appropriate measures 
to escape and that's how she survived. Another time we were loading diesel motors. Now we are back. So that was just a memory. Uh, now we are back to the time. Another time we were loading diesel motors um, onto freight cars under the supervision of some German soldiers. Edek was on edge. He, he had trouble restraining himself. Suddenly he exploded. The victim this time was my father. Now um, Edek is having another go at his father. At the first time he had a go at Elie Wiesel. Now at his father. You old lawfer, he started yelling. Is that what you call working? So he started getting really mad at Elie Wiesel's father. And he began to beat him with an iron bar. Again, inhumanity, cruelty, violence. At first, my father simply doubled over under the blows, but then he seemed to break into like an old tree struck by lightning. Simile. Simile, mainly to show that inhumanity and to show the pain uh, underwent by um, Elie Wiesel's father. I had watched it all happening without moving. That line is really important. I had, let me get a new color. I had watched it all happening without moving. I kept silent. In fact, I, I thought of stealing away in order not to suffer the blows. What's more, I felt anger at that moment. It was not directed at the cap capo, but my father. So he's saying that he um, stood there without moving. He was actually powerless. He was helpless. He kept silent. And he actually says that he was really angry at that moment, not to the father, not to the capo, but to the father. Why couldn't he avoid Edek's wrath? That was what life in a concentration camp had made of me. See, uh, that particular last, especially that, we could see the powerlessness here. There are many themes coming here. So when he says that he kept silent, we could see his powerlessness. If we look into, or if he tried to, defend his father he would definitely get another blow so it will be more trouble so he is actually powerless and we could see his powerlessness and again he says that i had watched it all happening without moving and at that time he says that i have got i was really angry at my father thinking that why couldn't he avoid why did he go and in front of edict's edict so that's what he thought so again that was what life in a concentration camp had made of me so it's a change Another theme is change. It's a page. Uh, it's a change that has happened to Elie Wiesel. If it was before, he would have defended his father. But now, the situation has changed, and that has changed. Even the father-son relationship has changed a little bit. So, the, the, the concentration camps actually perverts the father-son relationship. So that camp actually perverts the father-son relationship. Changes the father-son relationship because at this moment he is angry at his father for getting or for going in front of edict and he is not doing anything he is just keeping silent so that actually perverts the father-son relationship so we could see the theme of change we could see the theme of powerlessness in humanity another theme that you could see here is guilt he is really guilty about his inaction, guilt and inaction. He could have acted, he could have defended his father and that may have invited uh, more blows at him. So he is having that guilt and inaction. He has got that guilty feeling in his mind for not supporting and for not defending his father. So there are many themes coming there. Okay, so don't forget that in humanity, uh, powerlessness, guilt, inaction, change, the change in especially in the father-son relationship so that's really an important paragraph. Franek, the foreman, one day noticed the gold crown in my mouth. Franek, as I, as I told you, he's a good guy, but he, he's the foreman. And he's asking for the gold crown back now. Um, let me have your crown, kid. So he's asking for the gold teeth. I answered that I could not because without that crown, I could no longer eat for what they give you to eat, kid. Uh, I found another answer. My crown had been listed in the register during the medical checkup. This could mean trouble for us both. Uh, again, he says, if you don't give me your crown, it will cost you much more. All of a sudden, this pleasant, intelligent young man had changed. His eyes were shining with greed. I told him that I needed to get my father's advice. Go ahead, kid asked, but I want the answer by tomorrow. My, when I mentioned it 
to my father he hesitated after a long silence he said no my son we cannot do this uh, he will seek revenge he won't dare my son unfortunately franek knew how to handle this um uh, handle this he knew my weak spot he knew everyone knew that ali weasel's weak spot was his father my father had never served in the military and could not march in step but here whenever we moved from one place to another it was in step that presented franek with the opportunity to torment him on a daily basis to thrash him savagely left right he punched him left right he slapped him again you could see in humanity and in as ellie didn't give his teeth or gold tooth um he is taking of franek the fall man is actually taking revenge on his father for that because they he clearly knew that ellie is a loves his father and that his father is his weak spot I decided to give my father lessons in marching step and keeping time. We began practicing in front of our block. I would command left, right, and my father would try. The inmates made fun of us. Look at the little officer teaching the old man to march. Hey, little general, how many rations of bread does the old man give you for this? But my father did not make sufficient progress, and the blows continued to rain on him. So still, he started. The blows continued to rain on him. so you still don't know how to march in step you old good for nothing so again you could see the inhumanity and the violence and brutality this went on for 2 weeks it was untenable we had to give in that day panic burst into a savage like laughter i knew it i knew it that would uh, that i would win get better late than never and because you made wait it will also cost you a ration of bread a ration of bread for one of my pals a famous dentist from waso to pay him for pulling out my crown what my ration of bread so that you can have my crown franek smiled what would you like that i break your teeth by smashing your face that evening in the latrines the dentist from boso pulled my crown with help with the help of a rusty spoon franek became pleasant again from time to time he even gave me extra soup but it didn't last long two weeks later all the poles were transferred to another camp i had lost my crown for nothing so every time he tried to try to keep his things but he is losing that for nothing um so that's what his life in the concentration camps looks like a few days before the poles left i had a novel experience it was on a sunday morning our commander was not required to work that day only iric would not hear of uh, staying in the camp we had to go to the depot the sudden enthusiasm for work astonished us at the depot i took and trusted us to fanex saying do what you like but do something or else you will hear from me and he disappeared so i took actually disappeared from the workplace we didn't know what to do tired of huddling on the ground we each took turns strolling through the warehouse in the hope of finding something yeah, maybe a piece of bread perhaps that a civilian might have forgotten there when i reached the back of the building i heard sounds coming from a small adjoining room i moved closer and had a a glimpse of idak and an ink polish half naked on a straw mat so idak is abusing another young polish girl idak is having a sex having sex with another polish girl and now idak realized that um really we still saw this he moved 100 pr- prisoners so that he could copulate with this girl it struck me as terribly funny and i burst out laughing so ellie weasel when he saw he burst out laughing and idak jumped turned and saw me so Idak was really angry and mad that Ellie has has actually seen this. I wanted to run away, but my feet were nailed to the floor. Idak grabbed me by throat, hissing at me. He threatened, "Just you wait, kid. You will see what it cost your life. It cost cost to leave your work. You will pay for this later. And now go back to your place." So he was really angry at him. Half an hour, a half hour before the usual time, um, they started doing the roll call. I felt the sweat running my back. He called his uh, number. I stepped forward. They brought a cage. Lie down in on it, on your belly. I obeyed. I no longer felt anything except the lashes of the whip, and I dex started to whip Ellie Weasel just because he has seen um, his relationship with that Polish and Polish girl, and he got twenty five lashes. It was over. I had not realized it, but I had fainted. I came to, and they doused me with cold water. I was still lying on crate in a blur. 
I could see the background next to me that I heard someone else. So we could actually see uh, inhumanity and brutality there. At edX command 2, inmates lifted me and led to him, look me in the eye. I looked at him without seeing him. I was thinking of my father. He would suffer more than I. As, as he clearly know that his father loves him, he clearly knew that his father would um, suffer more than him because he loved him a lot. Listen to me, you son of a swine, said Ida coldly. So much for your curiosity. You shall receive five times more if you dare tell anyone what you saw. Understood. I nodded once, ten times, endlessly. Now, next one. One Sunday, as half of our group, including my father, was at work, the others, including me, took the opportunity to stay and rest. Around ten o'clock, the sirens started to go off, alert. They all gathered inside the blocks while the SS took refuge in the shelters. As it was relatively too easy to escape during an alert, the guards left the watchtowers. The electric current in the barb barbed wire was cut. The standing order to the SS was to shoot anyone found outside his block. So that was the order. In no time, the camp had the look of an abandoned ship. No living souls in the alleys. Next to the kitchen, two cauldrons of hot steaming soup had been left unattended, uh, untented. Two cauldrons of soup smack in the middle of the road. Two cauldrons of soup with no one to guard them. A royal feast going to waste, supreme temptation, hundreds of eyes were looking at them, shining with the desire, two lambs with hundreds of wolves lying in wait for them, two lambs without a shepherd, free for the taking, but who would they? So they saw two cauldrons of uh, hot steaming soup left unattended by anyone. Everyone has left when they, when they heard the alert. Fear was actually greater than hunger. Suddenly we saw the door of block 37 open slightly, a man appeared crawling snake-like in the direction of cauldrons. Hundreds of eyes were watching his every move. Um, and uh, he reached the first cauldron. Hearts were pounding harder. He had succeeded. Jealous, jealousy devoured us, consumed us. We never thought to admire him. Poor hero committing suicide for a ration of two or two or more of a swoop. In our minds, he was already dead. So they actually understood that this is going to put him uh, in danger. So fear. They were all came of fear. And uh, for a second, he seemed to be looking at the, himself in the soup, looking for his ghostly reflection there. And again, look at the word ghostly, his ghostly reflection. That's also a bit of foreshadowing because he is going to die. Then for no apparent reason, he left out a terrible scream, a death rattle such as I had never heard before. And with open mouth, thrust his head, towards its still steaming liquid so he was we jumped at the sound of the shot so he was actually killed by a shrapnel he was shot at that moment now what was happening there is they were actually the americans were actually bombing the buna factory someone shouted i anxiously thought of my father who was at work but i was glad nevertheless to watch that factory go up in flames what revenge while we had some talk of german military defeats on the various fronts, we were not sure if they were credible, but today this was real. So we actually understood that uh, American or Germans are going to uh, fail or German military def defeats, a uh, defeat is going to happen. We were not afraid. And yet if a bomb had fallen on the blocks, it would have claimed hundreds of inmates' lives. But we no longer feared death. We, uh, Elie Wiesel says that we no longer feared death. Uh, in any event, not this particular death, every bomb that fill, that hit filled us with joy, gave us renewed confidence. Why do you think that is? It's because they already have got that revenge. All the Jews have got that revenge against Germans and it, they were happy to see the German, um, German um, camps being bombed. They were happy to see that. Uh, because at, uh, mainly at this point, the, torture, the destruction of their torturers, the destruction of their Germans seems more important to prisoners than their own survival and liberation. They never care about their own survival and liberation. They care more about the revenge. They were happy to see the place bombed and they were happy to, they were more um, happy to see the destruction of the Germans. So there was actually a, a raid. That raid lasted more than, hour, more than an hour. Uh, again, everyone came out of the blocks. We breathed in air filled with fire, smoke, and our eyes shone with hope. Again, they were a bit 
hopeful because they knew that um, German is um, not going to have victory. A bomb had landed in the middle of the camp. All that, nothing much, nothing important. In the very center of the camp lay the body of the man uh, with soup stains on his face, the only victim. That was the only victim in that um, conflict, that time that happened. Uh, and again, an hour later, we saw the commandos, commandos returning in step as always. Happily, I caught sight of my father. So he was happy to see his father. One week, one week later, as we returned from work there in the middle of the camp, uh, a, an officer stood a black gallows. Um, uh, apple, 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 that uh, German word is actually, it's a location where they actually do the roll call. So we could see uh, on the, on like a, a word, it's actually a location. It's a, actually a word to do, describe the location of um, daily roll calling procedure. So at that, that area, they could see the black callows. We learned that the soup would be distributed only after roll call, which last, lasted longer than usual. The orders were given more harshly than on other days and there were strange vibrations in the air. Cap off, 10,000 caps came uh, off, nothing much. Two SS were headed towards the solitary confinement cell. They came back, the contempt man between them. He was a young boy from Warsaw. They are about to hang uh, a young boy from Warsaw. An inmate, and, sorry, an inmate with three years in concentration camps behind him. He was tall and strong, a giant compared to me. His back was to the gallows, his face turned towards his judge, the head of the camp. He was pale but seemed more solemn than frightened. His manacled, means handcuffed hands, did not tremble. His eyes were coolly ass assessing the hundreds of S's, the thousands of prisoners surrounding him. So he was just very bold at that time, even though they were about to hang him, he was really bold. Um, and they are reading out the... The prisoner number one is condemned to number, whatever number that is, is condemned to death. Let this be a warning and an example to all prisoners. Um, I heard the pounding of my heart. The thousands of people who died daily in Auschwitz and Birkenau in the crematorium no longer troubled me. But this boy leaning against his gallows upset me deeply. Again, that is um, upset, that particular scene, especially since that boy is a young one. Uh, that is actually upsetting Elie So. He just said, that boy just shouted loudly with liberty, my curse on Germany, my curse, my, and he couldn't complete that sentence. The executioner had completed his work. Like a sword, the order cut through the air. Another simile, the order came, and he was just, um, he was just killed, simile. Uh, tens of thousands paid the respect. Next page. The cap was forced everyone to look him squarely in the face. To look squarely at someone, that's actually an idiom. Look squarely at someone, that idiom means to look straight, look straight into the eyes. And look at the way the, the cap was actually forced these Jews to look at him, look at that boy. Again, that is a kind of um, brutality and violence and inhumanity, forcing people to see the death of the people. Afterwards, we were given permission to go back and we have our mail. I remember that on the day, the soup taster, the soup tasted better than ever. That day, soup tasted better than ever. So here we could see the change again in Elie Wiesel. His needs are very elemental at this point, that the desire for food is actually overcoming the disturbance of uh, the death. So the desire for food is the most important thing to self-preservation or self-preserving is the most important thing and that is the elemental the most elemental or the most important thing for Elie Wiesel now and uh, even uh, he is able to overcome the disturbance of the hanging of that person um, through through that food or through that soup and that's why he says the soup tasted better than ever I watched other hangings I never saw a single victim weep these withered bodies had long forgotten the bitter taste of tears except once um, and he says, next paragraph, in his service was a young boy in one of the Dutchman's, uh, under the, under the uh, commando, one of the Dutchman's commando, there was an young, there was an, there was a young boy, a people as they were called. People is like a child who actually has got a special favor, a very special child. 
So there was an young boy. This one had a delicate and beautiful face, an incredible sight in this camp. He was such a good boy. Everyone loved him. And in bracket, he says uh, his memories about another uh, another boy who, who was in Pipa. Sorry, another boy who was in Buna. And he was a different young guy. They often displayed greater quality than elders. I saw one of them, a boy of 13, actually beating his father for not making his bed properly. As the old man quietly weeped, the boy uh, is actually yelling at the father, if you don't stop crying instantly, I will no longer bring you bread. But the Dutchman's servant little was beloved, beloved by all. His face was the angel of dress. So this is his old memory back in Buna. This is just like an old memory. Something like an old memory that is that he has seen in Buna. But this line is all about this boy here. That young boy who was actually loved by everyone. And what's the speciality of the, that boy? It says he his face... His was the face of an angel in distress, so he has actually he was actually compared to an angel. His face was the a face of an angel in dis distress. So that's a metaphor there, comparison, comparing him to an angel, metaphor. And we could see the theme of innocence, theme of innocence. We could see the innocence uh, of that young boy. Again, uh, not reading. So one day the power failed at the central electric plant in Buna. Um, and uh, the guest was summoned to inspect the damage, concluded that it was a sabotage. They found a trail. It led to the block of the Dutch. Uh, after such a, after a search, they found a significant quantity of weapons. Uh, he was arrest, arrested, but his young people remained behind in solitary confinement. He too was tortured. So they tortured this uh, young boy. He too was tortured uh, and he too remained silent. And the SS then condemned him to death, him and two other um, two other inmates. So decided to kill that um, young boy who he uh, said just before, who had a face of an angel. One day, as we returned from work, we saw three gallows, three black ravens erected. The roll call, the SS surrounding us, machine guns aimed at us. The usual ritual, three prisoners in chains and among them, the little people, the sad eyed angel now. Here, Elie Wiesel is describing about that young guy's death. And again, he calls him sad-eyed angel. So, metaphor, comparing him to a sad-eyed angel because he's about to die. The SS seemed more preoccupied, more worried than usual. To hang a child in front of thousands of onlookers was not a small matter. The head of the camp read the verdict. All eyes were on the child. He was pale, almost calm, but he was biting his lips as he stood in the shadow, shadow of the gallows. Again, Stood in the shallow or shadow of the gallows. He is about to die. This time, um, the officer refused to act as an executioner. Three SS took his place. The, the three condemned um, prisoners together stepped onto the chairs in unison. The nooses were placed around their necks. Next, long live liberty, shouted the two men. The, but the boy was really silent, the young one. Where is the merciful God? Where is he? I wanted to underline that phrase. Someone behind me was asking, uh, where is the God? Where is merciful God? Where is he? Again, we could see the questioning. People are questioning their own faith, their loss of faith. At the signal, the three chairs were tipped over, total silence in the camp. On the horizon, the sun was setting. Again, just uh, not to reflect the death of that um, three people. Even the landscape, he talks about the sun was setting. Their life was actually ending. His voice cured as the first for the rest of the us, we were Weeping, they all were very sad. Then came March past the victims. The two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging up, hanging out, swollen and bluish. So here we are getting, this one is mainly loss of faith, the theme of loss of faith and the doubt and the questioning. Here we could see very graphic and violent imagery. Graphic, violent imagery of the death of the child says the tongues were hanging out swollen and bluish and he Ellie Wiesel uses these graphic and that is violent B-I-O the graphic and violent imagery to, to emphasize the pain of those people but the third rock again he says the third rock was still moving the child too light was still breathing and so he remained 
uh, for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, we think be, um, before our eyes and we were forced to look at him at close range. Again, inhumanity, inhumanity, killing an innocent child and again forcing other people to watch uh, the death of that child, inhumanity. His tongue was still red, his eyes were not extinguished. So it's really, uh, it's such a, such a terrible um, scene. And they are forced to witness. Sorry, guys. And they are forced to witness that whole paragraph. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, just like before. He is still asking, for God's sake, where is he? Someone is asking, for God's sake, where is he? And from within me, I heard a voice. Where is he? Where he is? This is where, hanging from his gallows. What does that mean? So here, it's loss of faith again. The theme is loss of faith. And here we could see when the other guy is asking, for God's sake, where is God? What is Elie Wiesel trying to say? He says that, yes, he is here. This is where, hanging here from his gallows. What does it indicate? Ellie actually feels as if his belief in God dies with that boy. That is, that's his feeling at that moment. He feels as if, as if his belief, as if his belief in God dies with that boy that's why with that boy that means that he has ceased or he ceased to be a faithful person he stopped to be a faithful person so we could see his change from a very devout jewish person to a person who actually says that there is no more god god dies with that boy so eli feels as if his belief in god dies with that boy um and finally, he says, that night, the soup tasted of corpses. Again, that is personification. We know that we can't, um, soup cannot, it's more like a can't taste of the corpse. That's a personification. Soup tasting of corpses. So we could see the youth, uh, the innocence of that boy, that young boy, that actually captured and crushed the heart of the rest of the prisoners. And that crushed the heart of Eli Wiesel as well. He couldn't stand the death of that um, young boy, that young um, innocent child. Earlier, we could see that Eli actually ceased to be able to, he stopped to be able to pray to God because he no longer believed that God was just. But now he has seen so much evil that he no longer believes in God at all. We could see his complete loss of faith. This complete lo loss of faith actually happens here. And that's why he says that this is where hanging from his gallows. God is actually hanging from his gallows. That means as if his beliefs in God dies with that of, um, with, with that boy, with that young boy. So his lo loss of faith and the change of Elie Wiesel, we could actually see in this chapter, mainly towards the end of this chapter. That's all about chapter four.